withdrawal of U.S. troops from the area has left the Kurdish community that controls that area under threat from the Assad regime to the south and from Turkey to across from across the northern border. The Kurdish-led Syrian Democratic Forces has borne the brunt of the fighting there against Islamic State. And in an interview today, the FDF commander, Maslum Kobani, spoke about the success his fighters have had against ISIS. But he also made clear the Kurds are not ready to just quietly accept the dictates of either Damascus or Ankara. I believe that during the next month we will officially announce the end of the military presence on the ground of the so-called caliphate. We fought the Islamic State terrorist organization and other terrorists on behalf of all humanity. This is why the Syrian Democratic Forces have the right to preserve their special status and to continue to protect northeastern Syria in the name of the Syrian National Forces. This is a red line and we will not concede this. Well, joining us from Washington is Bilal Wahab. He's a fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. And Bilal, let's start by looking at that comment by Kobani on he wants a, a special status accorded to those Kurdish, for his, his forces, the other ones that have been involved in the fight against Islamic State. Therefore, what exactly is he talking about? The parameters of uh, what special status means is not clear, and obviously that won't be clear until uh, negotiations take place between uh, the Syrian Democratic Forces uh, or the main arm of it, the YPG, and the Syrian regime on one hand, and it depends on the outside influencers such as the United States and, and Russia. But uh, the bottom line there is that Syrian Kurds, whom the world actually did not know until the Syrian civil war, uh, came to the international uh, scene through their valor and their role in fighting ISIS. And of course, the United States uh, held them as a partner in that, in, in, in that fight because they proved themselves uh, capable. Now they want to cash in on their sacrifices, both in blood and treasure. And uh, as I mentioned, people did not know that the Syrian Kurds existed or they had any grievances. And now is an opportunity to have some sort of self-autonomy. Now, the other example, the other model to follow would be the KRG model. But perhaps the Syria example is different. And uh, for them, it's a level of autonomy, uh, definitely security security of the areas that currently are under the control of the Syrian Democratic Forces, and perhaps more say in local governance and services. Uh, but they're not arguing for uh, secession from Syria. The, uh, the SDF is bound by the territorial in integrity of Syria. So they want to deal in which Syrian Kurds, for the first time in the creation of Syria as a country, will have more political cultural and economic well, rights Bilal, within to, Syria. I have to ask you how realistic that is. Unlike, say, in Iraq, in which there are still American forces, of course, the U.S. is pulling out of Syria. And again, in Syria, you have the Kurds there squeezed between the Assad government or regime in Damascus and, of course, the Turks. So how realistic is even any kind of perhaps autonomy for the Kurds? On the one hand, they're cashing in on uh, their ability, their organization, their military prowess. Uh, on the other, the, uh, the counterpart, uh, the Bashar Assad regime, despite regaining uh, some power and some leverage, they're not the power that they used to be before the civil war. Uh, and, and also there is an, an opportunity for a win-win uh, whereby um, Syria's uh, territorial integrity as a state and, and the current borders uh, would, would perhaps be only uh, preserved if the SDF and the uh, Assad regime were to work together. I mean, put it differently, I don't think the Assad regime wants a war with the Kurds, definitely not a Kurdish force that is well armed and well trained and has had uh, you know training in the battlefield by fighting a fierce force uh, such as ISIS so I think it's, it's in the interest of both sides uh, for uh, for the Kurds to have more rights within Syria and obviously the uh, Syrian Kurds also need the uh, the regime in order to protect themselves against Turkey a force that neither Bashar al-Assad regime is willing to fight or able to fight uh, nor are the SDF forces capable to fend them off on their so, own, as we saw last year in Afrin. But um, since you raised it, Bilal, would do you believe uh, that Turkey would accept the kind of arrangement you're speaking about, where those Kurdish forces are, in a sense, integrated within uh, a sort of Syrian military structure, but still retain their weapons? 
So the Turkish view has has not been stable. Uh, it, it has actually evolved. There was a time where the um, SDF and the YPG leaders were actually present in Ankara. They would speak in conferences in Ankara. That relationship wasn't always as bad as it is currently. Um, and it went from uh, good to bad. We also have another instant of Turkish relationship with another uh, group of Kurds, and that's Iraqi Kurds, that was very bad until 2007-2008, uh, where basically Kurdistan and KRG, sorry, K Iraqi Kurdistan and Turkish relations were very good, where, you know, Kurdistan is probably, for a while, was Turkey's second largest trade partner. So this relationship could change. It's not necessarily... Uh, ethnic enmity all the time. There is an element of geopolitics going on, and that's why this proposal of a, of a, a buffer zone between Turkey and the SDF uh, is important. Ultimately, what Turkey is afraid of is that uh, northeastern Syria will become a model and a launching ground for PKK activity and governance. And as long as the Syrian Kurds uh, prove that that is not a threat to Turkey, I think Turkey will go back to uh, being more moderate about it. And that's why the buffer zone on one hand, the deal between uh, SDF and Assad uh, comes to play. They need to assuage right. those Turkish uh, those Turkish fears. Uh, Bilal, uh, Kobani spoke very confidently about defeating uh, Islamic State, and yet we just saw ISIS carrying out terrorist attacks inside Manbij, which is, of course, a Kurdish stronghold. Uh, do you think, is he speaking to effect there, or uh, how confident can he really be that Islamic State is going to be wiped out in that part of Syria? I mean, we need to distinguish between Islamic State as a, as a group, as an insurgent and a, and, a, and a terrorist organization, and as a caliphate. Uh, what General Maslum was referring to is the end of uh, the caliphate, a territory holding organization where they can uh, uh, be governing a, a, a community or a, or a portion of community. And that has come to an end in Iraq, and that's coming to an end uh, in Syria. And I think the SDF have proven themselves, obviously, with the help of uh, U.S. air power and, and, and intelligence and, and training training, very capable of rolling them back. I mean, in 2017, uh, the SDF, of course, with a lot of casualties, captured Raqqa, that was the capital of, uh, uh, of, of ISIS caliphate. So if Raqqa was taken, I think the last pockets uh, of ISIS would be easier to take over. However, there is the uh, ISIS, the terrorist group, and that is the group that is not defeated. And obviously, the hornet's nest has been kicked. And uh, suicide bombings and, yeah. and assassinations and target killings are only to be, yeah. uh, to be increased. And that is, that is where the, the danger for yeah. security is going to lie. It's not enough just to defeat right. them. The, the territory, but to also maintain security. And that's also an right. area where um, uh, all sides uh, need cooperation, especially yeah. a cooperation between uh, the, uh, definitely with the help of, okay. the, of the SDF.